Hi, good evening, everyone. We have now Hurricane Nicole that continues to make its way across the Bahamas, about to make a secondary landfall across the coastline of Florida. This storm system is going to stretch across the East Coast, impacting uh, the DMV. When and how much rain will we see? Stay with us. I'll give you your extended forecast coming up. Good evening, and thank you so much for joining us for DC News Now at 9. I'm Thasmeen Mafus. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Flanagan. We'll begin tonight with breaking news. Police say a homeowner shot and killed someone who stormed his property. Yeah, so this happened on Waples Mill Road in Oakton shortly after 6 p.m. They say it started with some sort of an argument in the homeowner's yard, and then it quickly escalated. Our homeowner quickly retreated back inside his home. He retrieved the firearm from inside the home, and at some point, the man made entry into the home with an object that appears to be a large landscaping rock. The homeowner then fired and shot the man. He was pronounced deceased at the scene. Fairfax County detectives say they believe this is a case of self-defense. They say the homeowner was hurt and went to the hospital but were told is expected to be okay. A good day, I think, for democracy. And I think it was a good day for America. Our democracy has been tested in recent years, but uh, with their votes, uh, the American people have spoken and proven once again that democracy is who we are. And President Biden calling the midterm elections a good day for democracy. And tonight, the future of Congress hangs in the balance with many key races still too close to call. It was a night that showed surprising results for Democrats. From governor's races to Senate seats. Yeah, so at this hour, Republicans are on track to take control of the House. And there's a good chance Democrats could maintain control of the Senate, but with several key races still up in the air tonight, it's still too soon to say definitively what could happen in the coming days. The Virginia Democrats are celebrating after winning two competitive House races in Northern Virginia and keeping all four seats in the region. And yeah, Northern Virginia Bureau reporter Max Marcilla joins us live from Prince William County. That's a key portion of the district that Abigail Spanberger won. Yeah, Max, you've spoken with political analysts, candidates, and voters about why they think Democrats did so well in the region. Yep, it could be some combination of a number of things, uh, abortion and the state of democracy, two things that probably weren't emphasized enough in the lead up to the election. One other thing uh, from a political analyst we spoke with and you're about to hear from is the potential impact of former President Donald Trump. As 7th District Democrat Abigail Spamberger clinched a third term in Congress, she credited her voting record. Starting with listening, starting with engaging on the issues, and, uh, and, and really making clear the work that I've done. It seems her message resonated with voters, as did her attack ad, says Professor of Political Science Dr. Stephen Farnsworth. The campaign ads in this district over and over again by Spamberger just pummeled Vega on this comment about abortion, and that really resonated in suburban northern Virginia. We heard that from voters in Dumfries on election day. Great issues that about the pregnancy. Disagree with that. So made me come out. Yes, Lee Vega conceded on Wednesday morning, saying she looks forward to working with Spamberger in the future. Meanwhile, 10th District incumbent Democrat Jennifer Wexton earned her re-election bid on the strength of a 15-point advantage in Loudoun County. Farnsworth believes Republican challenger Hung Cow ran a strong race, but topping an incumbent is tough. They have greater name recognition, they have a greater ability to raise money, um, and they have experience. It was a Republican tide. But the tide turned out not to be very strong either. A Republican tide did help Virginia Republicans flip one seat in the Virginia Beach area as Elaine Luria lost to state Senator Jen Kiggins. Farnsworth says Kiggins was helped by a redrawn district and by how she presented herself. Having someone who is Trump adjacent, I think, in Virginia works a little bit better than somebody who is all in uh, with the former president. Now, earlier today, Republican state delegate Tim Anderson, representing parts of uh, uh, Virginia Beach area, he actually took on a Facebook post, posted a Facebook post in which he said the party should move away from former President Trump, saying that was a big reason why Virginia Democrats won the 7th and 10th districts. Reporting live in Manassas, Max Marcella, DC News Now.
All right, Max, and this just in, Kenyon McDuffie and Anita Bonds are the projected winners of the D.C. Council at-large race. Council member Alyssa Silverman conceded the election in the last hour. Silverman said she made congratulatory calls to both McDuffie, who is a current Ward 5 member, and Bonds, who ran for re-election. Silverman previously served as at-large council member alongside Bonds. And Maryland made history last night, electing its first black governor, Wes Moore. Cruised a victory, defeating Trump-backed Republican Dan Cox with an estimated 60 percent of the vote. Now, this is the first time in eight years Maryland will have a Democratic governor. Moore also joins former Virginia Governor Doug Walder and former Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick as only the third black governor elected nationwide in U.S. history. Now, coming up at 9:30, DC News Now talks to the governor-elect one-on-one -on -one about his plans to improve education and tackle crime. Well, Maryland's voted to allow people 21 and older to use recreational marijuana. Even though it was legalized, there's still a lot of questions about what that will mean for you. Our Michaela Newton spoke with Frederick County residents and looked at what comes along with the changing law. Marylanders overwhelmingly approved a measure Tuesday that would make recreational use of marijuana legal in the state, giving people the right to have 1.5 ounces or two marijuana plants. In Frederick County, most residents we spoke with say they voted yes to the question on this year's ballot. There's a lot of people who have actually been to jail for, like you said, small portions of marijuana. So I really think that they should consider those people and also free them if that's all they're in jail for. Uh, I'm really excited for it. I think it's ridiculous for it to be criminalized and for people to not be able to do what they need to do. It also makes it easier for people who need medical marijuana, um, which is an, it, medical freedom is really important to me. While most people won't be able to smoke weed legally in the state until July, Maryland's medical marijuana program is available for people with medical marijuana cards. Supporters say legalizing recreational marijuana can bring in more money to the state with taxes and tourism. But they also note it will be critical for Maryland to make sure all communities are able to cash in when it comes to the marijuana business. But some people say they just want the effort to promote more safety in the state. But I think it's really important that people have access to it freely. Otherwise, they're just going to go to sketchier and like worse places and who knows like what's laced in that. Right now, possession of marijuana is decriminalized, but you can be fined up to $250 if you're found with 1.5 to 2.5 ounces. Following these election results, the state is also planning to create automatic expungements of past marijuana possession convictions. Reporting in Frederick, Maryland, Michaela Newton, D.C. News Now. If five states had similar marijuana proposals on the ballot, Maryland and Missouri voted to approve legalization, while voters in Arkansas and the Dakotas ruled against it. Now, once this new law takes effect, recreational marijuana will be legal in 21 states and D.C. All right, we are halfway through the work week. Let's get a check on the forecast now with Chief Meteorologist Janessa Webb. Yeah, Janessa will be mild, and then we're going to feel that big drop in temperatures. Yeah, we have this temperature swing that continues to really take over uh, the DMV. We do have a large storm system that is about to impact uh, the area. I'll show you that in our extended forecast. But right now, our temperatures, they're slowly but surely going down tonight. It will not be as cold as last night. We're in the upper 30s and mid 40s in most spots. But still, the chill is definitely in the air. And the reason why it's slightly warmer, you don't have those winds to contend with compared to yesterday. A northerly breeze, and that's finally subsided. So your hour by hour for the next few hours will sit under mostly clear skies. And then overnight, we're going to continue to watch uh, the clouds start to filter in. Now, I do think tomorrow morning, still a lot of clearing taking place. It's just towards uh, northern Virginia. You'll start to notice uh, the cloud coverage. And it's due to this area of low pressure that's starting to swing in across the Carolinas and that's due to this tropical system that now has transitioned into our eighth hurricane of the 2022 hurricane season and you can see the feeder bands that are really making their way into Florida now a tropical excuse me hurricane Nicole has already made one landfall across the Grand Bahamas it will make a secondary landfall overnight into a tomorrow morning across the western shores of of Florida. Then this storm system will slowly but surely creep along uh, the East Coast. What are the impacts across the DMV? We'll look at that coming up.
All right, Janice, thanks. All new tonight. Loved ones gather to remember a 15 year old boy shot and killed last week near the D.C. Convention Center. Makai Green was gunned down on Friday. A shooting suspect hopped out of a silver Mercedes, ran into an alley, and shot at the team. Green is the 16th child to die in a shooting in the district this year. And D.C. voters said yes to Initiative 82, meaning tip workers will soon have more money in their pockets. The ballot item increases the minimum wage for servers and other tipped employees. Our reporter, Mariel Carbone, has been following this issue closely. She's live for us in Georgetown tonight. And Mariel, D.C. voters approved a similar measure back in 2018, but the council overturned it. It did, and that's why some people wonder if that could happen or will happen again. But supporters say that they feel pretty confident. This time around, there was a lot more support for this measure, so they're feeling good about it. A new minimum wage will soon go into effect for tipped workers in D.C. after overwhelming support at the polls. It will lead to greater pay equity. Initiative 82 incrementally increases the minimum wage for tipped employees from the current 535 an hour to the full minimum wage of 1610 an hour by July 2027. 74 percent of people voted yes on Tuesday, much higher than the 56 percent of people who voted yes when the same issue, then called Initiative 77, was on the 2018 ballot. Despite it passing then, council overturned the public's decision and did not implement it, which has been largely criticized. To see it passed by such an overwhelming margin really tells me that this is not only a a yes for uh, paying people a fair wage, but a rebuke to what the council did four years ago. I think it was an overwhelming vote. So how does the mayor ensure the will of the people um, so is implemented this gonna, time? And what we would be willing to do is partner with industry uh, to facilitate conversations to assure that there is robust public education around the issue. The restaurant industry largely campaigned against Initiative 82, saying an increase on the payroll could lead to cuts in jobs. And one bartender told us earlier this summer it'll do more harm than good. These people are trying to take advantage of, of our situation. In a statement, the Restaurant Association of Metropolitan Washington says, We are disappointed with its passage and the new reality that awaits our vibrant industry during a time of already challenging economic recovery. And back during the summer, a restaurant owner told me that if this passes, businesses will likely handle this differently. Some restaurants may implement a service charge on your bill. Others may lay off staff members, and uh, some restaurants might not do anything at all with this new wage increase. Reporting live in Georgetown tonight, I'm Marielle Carbone, DC News Now. Marielle, thank you. And coming up, we're hours away from a major announcement about the Washington Commanders. As we wait for the big reveal, our Dave Laval joins us live with Dan Snyder's recent fallout and potential sale of the team. Plus, DC News Now is your local election headquarters. On the other side of the break, one Marylander is making state history for his age. We'll talk to him about his future plans as a politician. You're watching DC News Now at 9, covering the news where you live, from Washington, DC to West Virginia. Stick around. We'll be right back.